So I'm Ryan McLeod. I'm warpling on everything. If you uh, stare at this O long enough, have any of you seen this? You'll notice that the colors slowly fade to white, and you're, you learn how to spell McLeod. <laughs> it's important. Um, just your humble reminder that the human faculties are flawed. Does anyone have to disappear? No? OK. If you know me, it's probably for Black Box. Um, Black Box is one of the most hated apps on the App Store, uh, also beloved. But it's all about solving puzzles where you don't touch the screen and you think outside the box. It involves the cosmos and friends and getting in touch with yourself. And it's something I've been working on full time for the last two years and continue to design puzzles for. As you can see, it's, it's pretty out there and weird. Um, let's see, exactly a year and an hour ago, it won this uh, Apple Nightlight, which is <laughs> pretty sweet. Currently, currently on loan, my dad's uh, surf trophy shelf because he's way cooler. And uh, this is my attempt at a sports trophy. <laughs> so. Anyway. So I want to talk about sleight of hand. Um, when I originally pitched this title to Jessie, she said there have been speakers before that have done like actual magic on stage and that people might get confused. And I said, let's see. Do you guys mind if I check notes? I can't. I, uh, <laughs> I sort of wrote something down here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we were going to call it sleight of hand in, uh, in digital design. So we'll just go with that. Cool. <laughs> anyway. I like to stick to iOS magic. That's not really my forte. Anyway, the gist of what I want to talk about today is that there's this beautiful honesty in analog design and that all good digital design requires ample sleight of hand. Um, I want to talk about my discovery of these two things and then give you guys some examples and you can see what you think. So a few years ago, um, <laughs> I used to take everything apart. And sometimes I'd put those things back together and sometimes those things would continue to work. Um, eventually, the logical conclusion of this is I wanted to be on BattleBots. <laughs> so I got pretty into robotics. I thought, I was like in fifth grade, I think, I was going to take a Lego robot and put like a metal salad bowl over it, and it was going to be <laughs> like good to go. <laughs> uh, it takes quite a bit more than that. So I eventually found some like weird GeoCity pages, and I discovered a weird subset of robotics called, called Beam. I was, was going to invert the color on these for night mode, but then I decided if I leave it white, it actually might illuminate you guys, and it's working. <laughs> so beam robots are weird. They're, like, they're made out of scrap. They're usually solar powered. They don't use circuit boards. They're usually like free form, like origami in a way. And they can be really pretty. They're really interesting. They're not what you would expect from a normal robot. It's sort of, sort of more like a bug. And beam is a backronym. Oh, get ahead. For biological, electronic, aesthetic, mechanical. And the backronym is sort of beam and nods to the fact they're usually solar powered. So robots, of course, are electronic and mechanical, and making them aesthetical or aesthetic is nice. The biological aspect of beam is probably the most interesting thing. Whereas a lot of robots want to simulate biology, beam sought to just commandeer it and like recreate it as a simple way to make alive seeming things. And Beam really wrote off things like BattleBots as just weaponized remote controlled cars. And it sort of laughed at the notion of things like ASIMO, which were very complex, tons of if statements of how it should proceed in the world, but literally fall on its face on like a literal stage demo. I don't know if you saw the background, it says Honda, the power of dreams. <laughs> a little awkward, I don't know. <laughs> So Beam instead let's, said, let's draw inspiration from nature. Nature is super robust. It's, uh, you, you, 
ants can, things like ants, they can lose legs, they can lose limb, they will continue to go on and try to serve the queen or build a bridge or like work together to make a raft to float across water and survive, even though they like, don't really have knowledge of each other. And these creatures are so simple, their brains are just knots of neurons. They're not as complicated as the stuff like between our ears. It's almost like if you can map out the plumbing of a city, you can sort of understand the analog machinery of an ant. Similarly, if you've seen uh, nanobot swarms, also known as starlings, these are birds. There's no server, there's no GPS. Like, they don't even know where more than like seven birds around them are. They just have really simple rules. They follow each other. And then there's some perturbations in the wind or whatever, and they seem to move around in this giant swarm. And so there's very complex behavior that emerges from something very simple and very simple rules. And these are not robots, it's just analog birds. So a book that really changed this for me and helped me understand this stuff was Vehicles um, by Valentino Breitenberg. And this, this is an awesome book. It's also out of print, which seems to be a thing that layers designers like to recommend in talks. <laughs> so if you're playing layers bingo, that's a free square. Vehicles is a work of science fiction. Not saying it's fake, it's, but it's about fictional science. So this guy used to, he would look into the brains of flies and small insects and stuff and see the simple machinery. And these creatures exhibit human behaviors, like we want to say that they have fears and wants and needs and things like that. But he could look and describe and sort of understand that stuff. And said, what if we sort of look at these abstract creatures that I make up and work through them to a logical conclusion and see where the gray line sort of begins and where it ends. So I want to talk through the first two chapters of this book with you guys. The first is, uh, is vehicle one. And you can call them vehicles, you can call them creatures. It starts with this abstract notion of a creature. And this can live on the scale of the cosmos traveling between stars or as like pond scum. And we'll go with the pond scum example because friction and water and things helps with this a bit. This simple creature has some form of propulsion, a motor, a flagella, something to move forward and has some sort of simple eye for sensing the world, some sort of stimulus like heat or light. When you introduce some sort of stimulus for this thing, say it's light, say it's the sun, it's attracted to it. And you might be wondering, like, this thing can't turn. So say the water pushes it slightly one way and it gets knocked. If it's facing that thing more, it's gonna go harder towards it or softer, and it's sort of gonna end up towards it if there's enough randomness around. Super boring, super basic. It probably seems like a robot to you. You can imagine it with a slightly different form factor. Maybe it's a little more confusing. Something with really simple rules seems to be kind of alive. If we take the same vehicle and we go through some messed up cell division or something that happens, we get this robot that kind of has two forms of propulsion and two senses that are wired to each other. It's an analog circuit, there's no computer. And now with something like this, if it's offset from its light source, this left one is gonna go harder and the right one is going to go less. And if it's pointed straight at it, it's gonna go straight. And this creature will head towards its target and sort of cruise away from it as it gets closer and then go towards another one and sort of cruise away from it. And if you observe it long enough, it appears to have a fear of this light source. Maybe that seems like a stretch. We take another creature and say it got miswired during its division. This sort of has an opposite effect, where now, when the sun is stronger on the right, the left motor is going to go harder, and when they're both straight in front, it's going to go at it and charge and go faster and faster. And if this was something like a light bulb, it's going to go at it and smash it, and it's going to destroy it, and then it's going to go on to the next one and do the same thing. And you could say that this little vehicle has aggression. I won't go on and on with these. There's just two more. If you have these negative thresholds, where the more it sees, the less it goes on that side you see more interesting behaviors, like a robot that can kind of appear to love its source. It sort of cruises towards it and then slows down and rests until it moves. Or another one that will cruise towards these sources and then careen away and look for another one. It's sort of curious or inquisitive. If you skip forward a few chapters and actually implement one of these 
You might get something like Mark Tilden's uh, Walkman, which he's sort of the founder of the field of uh, Beam Robotics. And I love, this is like a VHS sort of clip. Um, Walkman was actually built out of parts from a Sony Walkman. And he created sort of, I forget if it's eight or 16 of these uh, synthetic neurons, which sounds really complicated, but I mean, we just kind of did something on a similar scale. It's drawn out there on the table. This little robot isn't programmed with how to walk. It turns on and it learns how to walk to achieve its goal of gathering lights and avoiding walls and not getting stepped on or mangled. This thing can have its legs ripped off. It can be put in like a tape holder. It'll change its behavior and figure out how to succeed. And again, there's no computer in this. People are always looking for like a hidden modem and it's just, it's, it's such a simple thing, but it exhibits this really complex behavior. And again, if this is hard to see as like life and to assign human-like traits to, just try to imagine it with a squishier, more Fantasia exterior, something like this little guy. You can take vehicles to its logical conclusion. <laughs> and I think the gray line is a little harder. It's more blurred. You have to ask yourself, you know, like, <laughs> is, this, like is this psychology? And if you can't imagine it as the robot, imagine it with a little squishy exterior, and you probably are going to think it's that. Like, these simple analog systems are worth asking, is this human? And this thing is not worth asking that, even though it's like <laughs> mountains more complex than the previous thing. So like in learning all this robotic stuff, I sort of found that there's this beautiful honesty in analog design. And that's not just robots, that's like you can open the back of a toilet that's like broken and like shoestring it together and like understand that system and fix it. You can look at a bike and like follow the machinery and understand it as a human. Whereas a computer system that can be more difficult. So when I was learning this stuff, I used to build these things, and these were like components you could hold with like 13-year-old fingers and like read, because they're not that small. But the problem was miniaturization was happening, and surface mount components were kind of becoming a big deal. And so this is a lot harder to assemble without $1,000 equipment. These stores where I used to kind of get these parts were going out of business. Um, these were such cool places, but. Microcontrollers are sort of on the rise at this point. And when you try to learn how to program a microcontroller, which is basically just a computer, you, one of the first things you do is try to create just like a flashlight circuit. Flashlight is an analog system. Ooh, had to do that. It's a very simple circuit where you have a power source, a bulb, and maybe you have a switch. And a switch is just a glorified word for like a break in a wire that you close. And so when the circuit is closed, the light bulb is on. And when you open the circuit, the light bulb turns off. Pretty simple, right? How many people have messed with an Arduino? It's a lot of people. Cool. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's like a $30 open source microprocessor, really fun to play with. This was my first intro to digital systems, sort of. Now, Arduinos. We don't have to talk about a specific brand. It's basically a black box. I'm sorry. <laughs> and when you mess with these things, you don't wire them up. You sort of connect your components to it. But you, it doesn't know how to talk to those things. It doesn't know how to make those things happen. So you have to write some code to say, you know, when this button gets pressed, send the power from the thing to the light, toggle it on. You have to tell it how to do all this stuff. And so you would expect. This first tutorial, like chapter one, is pretty easy. You wire this thing up, and you say, when we press the button, we're going to turn the light on. Going to turn the light on. We'll turn it off. My slides are not messed up. This is what happens. What you just witnessed is called switch bouncing. And this is like, you're making the simplest thing in the world, and this is the first, you have to learn about physics. Switch bouncing is where, as a switch is closing and like metal contacts are coming into proximity with each other, electricity arcs and things happen, there's like spikes. And so the digital system that's more robust, like it doesn't just see a simple on, it sees something more complex. And so you have to learn how to do switch debouncing, where you introduce electronics or you count how many times there's spikes to understand that the switch just went from on to off. 
This is really stupid. <laughs> the human expectation is the switch is off, you press the button, the switch turns on, and you release the button, the switch turns off. So like, why is that not happening? If you look at what's actually happening to the system, which we'll do in slow motion here, you have this sort of electrical signal that's going to arc past a midpoint, and the system's going to consider it on, and then it sort of goes off, and then we're going to, it's on, and then it sort of reaches a stabilizing point and is just considered on. But this is random, and depending on how many times this happens, your light bulb either turns on or it turns off. This is like so complex, and you've barely begun. But the analog system also did this, is the funny thing. When you turn that switch on, the light bulb flickered on. But it flickered on so fast that your flawed human vision, due to like persistence of vision, didn't see it turn on. But the human experience and the truth there is that the light bulb just turned on. So this is kind of weird. The problem is we see one thing, and this is our truth, and the system that's more accurate sees a different sort of truth to what's going on. So you have this beautiful honesty and analog stuff, and then you realize all good digital systems require like tricks like this from the start. A lot of tricks. Whether you want to call them lies or kind of tricks or sleight of hand is, is up to you. But we have to do a lot of work, a lot of extra stuff to make these digital things feel natural and to feel human. And so I'd like to step through some of my favorite examples and you can sort of be the judge and maybe I can ruin your world for you. A really technical example is context switching. Context switching is when a CPU wants to run multiple programs at once. So how many people run multiple programs at once? <laughs> yeah. Some of my favorite programs, uh, maybe Sketch and Spotify, I want to run at the same time. Technically, a processor, simply speaking, can only do one instruction at a time. So if you want to run both of these things at the same time and not have your Carly Rae like, skip, you have to do something funny, which is called context switching, where the processor is just constantly jumping between two different things really fast but we're too slow to really see the difference, and it works out. If you think this is a trick, just remember that CPUs are literally rocks that we tricked into thinking. <laughs> but don't oversimplify it. First, you have to flatten the rock, and you have to get lightning inside of it somehow. <laughs> Great one from Daisy Owl. That is interesting typeface. That is not, anyway. Motion smears. Shout out to Pascal for showing these to me. This is in, if you freeze frame an animation, you'll see something like septa leg SpongeBob. And this is not a composite. This is like an animator went in and drew this with all these legs. And this is because when you have a cartoon at 12 or 14 frames a second and you just animate the legs moving, it doesn't feel or look human or right. This feels more correct which is sort of weird. And there's this Tumblr that has amazing examples of these. These are real frames. Like, this is grotesque. <laughs> but someone sat there and like, knew that they needed to draw this <laughs> like, to make it feel more real. It's just bizarre. And films had different guidelines on how their uh, motion smears were to look to feel more real. And I don't know, this feels like, this is, don't pause stuff ever. <laughs> iOS uses this now. When you open an app, it'll look at that bottom pixel or row of pixels and sort of stretch it out and do the smear. So the thing that's moving towards you and elongating sort of has a little bit more of a, a natural feel to it and that context is maintained. Um, this, I use this in black box. A lot of apps do this. If you have one view and you're moving to another view and it has shared elements, you want to sort of continue the context and have this trans transitional interface that shows you where you're going. To the engineer, it sort of, it feels like you have a view and you have another view, so just slide the view on top of the other view. And the sliding sort of shows that something is coming on top. But now you're seeing a thing that existed here and a thing existing here, and there should only really be one of them. So if you want to make this look sort of more correct, and this is how it uh, actually looks in the game, where the thing moves into place, you have to do a lot of extra weird complex work, and some of you are probably experienced in this. So like in Blackbox's case, 
these little lights down here, these squares, I have to kind of hide them and then bring this view on top and then hide the background of the view and move those things on top of where the other thing was going to be. And this all happens before you're, there's even a page refresh and you can see what happened. And then we animate the thing and it looks beautiful. This is like total sleight of hand lie. It feels wrong. Another favorite example is what I like to call oh shit mode on the iPhone. How many of you have uh, gotten a phone call and your phone's in your bag or something and you're scrambling to shut it down and you might have grabbed the volume button? If you tap the volume buttons, they, it kills the volume of the ringer. And this is not what the volume buttons are supposed to do, right? They're not wired to do that. But someone thought like, huh, when you used to have a landline and you wanted it to shut up, you ripped it out of the wall. <laughs> so let's make a digital sort of metaphor for that. Rest in peace. <laughs> Does anyone remember how long vines are? Seven? It's actually six. Six, yeah. Yeah. So the funny thing is uh, that's wrong. You can upload up to six and a half seconds. I've never really seen a good explanation of why, but a theory that I really like is when you're working with clips and say it's rounding down, you see that your clip is six seconds, but really it was 6.3 and it got rounded down. Like, just allow people to upload it, and it's a better experience. Sort of a lie, you're telling people it's all about six second clips, but. Instagram is sort of a famous example a lot of you probably know. You go to upload something, you're working on your title, in the background that clip is being uploaded, and then after 20 minutes when you're done writing the perfect caption for whatever the hell you're doing, <laughs> you hit share, and it's not really shared, it's just allowed to be. This is, I think of the analog as like, you have a photo, a Polaroid, and you're like writing on it, and you wanna like toss it to someone. You don't expect that you have to like wait for it to go to someone else. So, you fake it. Video games are some of the best examples in this. Um, Jennifer Schrull, she's an amazing Polygon writer, sort of asked a bunch of people for, game developers for examples, and how they sort of bend the truth in games. I think video games are like some of the greatest storytelling. And storytelling isn't always the whole truth. So she got some amazing answers to this. Uh, one was from creators of Bioshock, which is that the first enemy, their bullet, like always misses you. And this is so you don't have these out of the blue, like I just got shot moments. And this is sort of to deal with human attribution uh, bias, where you think when negative things happen, it must be your environment, and when positive things happen, it must be your skill. So it's a little sleight of hand, but it makes the game a lot more enjoyable for people. Uncharted does this really well. If you've ever played Uncharted, there's amazing scenes where you're running across a bridge and you just like jump at the last minute and it feels like you are awesome. Like, sorry, but you're not. <laughs> they will take the ideal path of you going along that thing and the animation of the thing collapsing and adjust it so you just like barely make it across. And it feels awesome. Another one is uh, Coyote Time. A lot of amateur game developers make platformers, and when you're making that platformer and you're running, it feels wrong. You slip off the edge and you die, or you don't make it to the end and you slip off and you die. And it's because it doesn't have Coyote Time, which is where you extend the window you're allowed to jump or how far you're going to make it. And without this, platformers just don't feel right. Last example here. I hope everyone knows this, right? Maybe you don't know the term. Mario Kart famously uses uh, rubber banding, which is the effect where people in last are getting better power-ups than the people in the front. And this is to introduce contention and sort of make the game more human. You're playing with the people around you. And this is why we love this. This is why Mario is so beloved over you know, hyper-balanced games. And it's, it, really, it really nails that human experience of playing with your friends. So, I could go on and on with examples. Um, I hope these few have made it clear how much sleight of hand, layers and layers of sleight of hand go into making digital stuff feel more human and feel more right. And I hope you'll remember to take the license to do whatever is necessary to make the things that you make more human. Thank you. <laughs>